this is the second of three programs uh, that we'll, we will be having um, on Fridays at noon. Um, today, we're going to be focusing on uh, the Artist and Writing Fellowships, that is the Gordon Artist uh, Fellowship and the Nature and Words Writing Fellowships. Overall, this summer, we, despite the, all the craziness going on with the COVID and coronavirus, um, we still were able to hold our uh, field station programs. And so uh, this past summer, we had nine researchers working on six different uh, environment research pro projects. We had three Nature and Words Fellows. We had two Gordon Art Fellowships, two Stevie Land Management Fellowships, a Ballo Water Resource Fellowship, um, and a Watershed Management Plan project uh, that had a couple field technicians. Uh, last week, we focused on uh, those last three. Uh, today, we are going to focus on our three Nature and Words Fellowships and our two Gordon Art Fellowships as well. Um, so just a, a quick thing about how this is going to work. Uh, we have essentially video presentations. Uh, and so we'll be going through each of those video presentations. And then we'll have a short question and answer period after each video. Um, because I do want to try to make sure we get this in as close to an hour as possible. Um, we may not be able to get to all the question and answers that you have. Um, and so uh, just it, uh, if you want to make sure you kind of get that out there, make sure you type it in, type it in fast, and we'll try to try to get to as many questions and answers as we can. Um, and But I apologize kind of in advance if we aren't able to get to all of them um, because of time. All right. So... Our first video is going to be uh, from Addison House, who is from Kalamazoo College. And in just a second, I will be able to. Welcome to Cardboard Castle. My name is Addison House and I am a Kalamazoo College junior studying English and Women, Gender and Sexuality. This summer I was a 2020 Nature and Words Fellow where I wrote a poetry chapbook exploring feminist retellings of fairy tales and their association with nature. Cardboard Castle is my poetry chat book that contains 30 individual poems broken into five sections. These five sections loosely follow the hero's journey, paralleling um, five different places between the call to action and the revelation period, and it upsets this ending, which is not where the hero's journey ends, as a way to question the male protagonist and often patriarchal way that the hero's journey is used. The illustrations on this side, drawn by Sydney Radical Finnegan, highlight three sections, the spiral staircase, the keep, and the chamber within the chapbook, and each one has its own definition paralleling a new version of a hero's journey that disrupts the original. The poetry itself is also rooted in the language of nature, which often holds its own anti-feminist connotations. As you'll see in the following two poems, I took language I learned and the landscape I was surrounded with at Pierce Cedar Creek Institute to question fairy tales, their purpose, and their future. This poem, entitled Undress Yourself, was one of my experiments with form, and in this case, specifically couplets. It takes on the story of Little Red Riding Hood and gives it a direct and contemporary take. Here is Undress Yourself. You're kissing a wolf, masquerading as your protector. You forgot to ask why, such big ears, such big eyes, such big mouth. You let it undress you, never asked why it wants your naked body. You're kissing a wolf and no one ever taught you that you can say no. You walked right through the door, latched with wet straw. He created his own trap. You're not the only girl. You let him promise safety in a nightgown without looking at the basket of blood red berries. You're kissing a wolf, but this isn't about the kissing. This is about the soft spot between my ribs. I said no.
When I was writing this poem, the title came first. The poem itself had many different forms as it grew, and like several others in this collection, my mentor Bella saw a prose poem where line breaks weren't effective. This is Building Nests. Here are the baby birds I am trying to protect. The box is latched, the door is locked. There's a tower. I make bird nests with my hair, lay eggs between the loose strands of summertime reds and autumn golds and spring's grains of wet sand. They are locked in this tower where the sun can kiss them every morning, but the noonday can't bake them for lunch. I have all this hair and all this time to grow. I am growing thin strands with hints of purples, a little bit of blue in the clouds. The peak of the tower peeks through, stretching with each latch of the locked door, a click into place like the place of each hair. These are fading couplets. Couplets building a home, couplets of color until the cycles start again, until my hair is long enough, until they fill bigger gaps and warm up the newly hatched eggs, my baby birds. I'm trying to protect these baby birds, locking them in a tower until they match the browns of my mother in the winter, until I match my mother. While writing nearly every day this summer, I also read several books, including the Norton Critical Edition of Classic Fairy Tales and a collection of feminist retellings entitled Kissing the Witch. I spent all of August and the second half of July editing these poems closely with Bella, and now I am hoping to self-print the chapbook and distribute it for family and friends, as well as apply to several competitions, including the Michigan Writers Cooperative Press Chatbook Contest, the Celery City Chatbook Contest, which is based in Kalamazoo, and the Cauldron, which is Kalamazoo College's literary magazine. This chapbook could certainly not have been completed by myself, and I want to first give a huge thank you to my mentor, Bella Agosa, and Pierce Cedar Creek Institute for helping, to, helping me to make this project happen from the very beginning of the process and giving me the time and space in which to do it this summer. Um, I would like to thank Sydney Radical Finnegan for the illustrations you see here in this presentation, as well as several others, and to Hyla House and Meadow Lodge folks, and to several beta readers for this, of this collection for all of their help along the way, teaching me words and having a good time this summer. And most importantly, I'd like to thank my parents for always, always, always believing in me and encouraging me to do things that are outside of the box, that are hard, and that... I would have to push myself for it because this is a big project and they were always very supportive. Hi Isabella, thank you for joining us. All right, um, all right, so uh, uh, we, we don't have any questions as of yet. Um, but uh, uh, is there anything else that you want to share about your experience this, this summer? Um, <laughs> I mean, we, like, in spite of COVID, did have a lot of fun and, like, were able to do things um, that I think was really productive for writing this chat book. Um, some of the things we, like, went swimming and, like, I was able to go with Megan and Faith um, to, like, look at the box turtles and that definitely inspired my poetry, too. Um, because I was able to like physically be at Pierce Cedar Creek and do those things. Questions now? <laughs> uh, well, yeah, I, let's see. Uh, I, don't, I don't see any open open questions at the moment. Um, I I guess a question for you. Another question for you is. Um, if people were interested, uh, and you had talked a little bit about kind of making a collection, uh, do you plan on actually having a printed collection at the Institute that uh, people could maybe purchase or um, uh, uh, would, you know, how would, how would, if people wanted to hear more or read more, how would they get their hands on that? Yeah, so hindsight's twenty twenty, and I should have put in my budget part of like getting it printed because it turns out it's really expensive. Um, but I'm, so I'm still trying to figure out like how to do those things. And I'm definitely, I really, I want for myself a physical edition. And I know like my family would want one as well. 
Um, so I think, yes, somehow I'll figure that out and I'll probably end up talking to you a lot about how I'm going to eventually do that and maybe use like a local printing place so that it's like there's um, just some more community involvement in that too. Um, someone also asked in the chat, like what inspired me most um, at the Institute. Um, and I think the Red Trail walk around Brewster Lake was like one of the best places because you had a couple of stopping points and you could kind of listen and write and um, reflect on what was happening in the world. Um, and I used those, that trail a lot and those like um, outlook places to sit down and write when I needed to and then be able to like go back and edit in my own space after having some stuff down. Um, maybe we'll do one more question. And there's a couple of questions about fairy tales that you found particularly interesting to think and reconsider, or um, maybe talking uh, about some of the steps um, in writing these poems and like, why did you pick certain, yeah, why did you pick certain yeah. fairy tales? Um, so like I said in the presentation, I read like the classic editions of fairy tales and in the Norton Cl critical edition, there's like several different versions. Um, and there's like, as new as like the 70s or 80s, like retellings from like the original Grimm's or the oral versions that got written down. Um, and I like accidentally kept coming back to like Snow White and Red Riding Hood and Beauty and the Beast. Um, I don't know, those women themselves and those characters um, seem to speak to me a lot. And I particularly got interested in Angela Carter's The Tiger's Bride, which is a retelling of the Beauty and the Beast story. Um, I think just I grew up liking the Beauty and the Beast a lot. And so like hearing these different versions of it was really interesting and new to me. And I latched on to those stories in which I felt like more things needed to be said and like reworking the idea of the original tale. All right. Well, unfortunately we're gonna have to move on to our next presentation. Um, so thank you, Addison, for uh, uh, coming in and uh, speaking yeah. with us. And thank you very that's, much. That's, now you can get on the class. <laughs> All right, and so let's see, uh, let's see here, let's, uh, da, da, da. Um, My name is Ashley Postma. I'm a student at Aquinas College, mentored by Chris Laporte, and I'm one of the recipients of the Gordon Art Fellowship through the Pierce Cedar Creek Institute this year. This is my project entitled, An Exploration of Time, Change, and Nature. I covered a couple of topics involving time, change, and nature through my artworks, one of which is succession, the process in which an environment naturally and gradually changes over a long period of time. The usual order of succession is from lake to wetland to grassland to immature forest to mature forest. I also took into consideration the effect of humans on the environment and visual topography. In addition to these more objective concepts, I hope to incorporate my personal experience with the environment, specifically how I perceived individual locations changed over time. In portraying these concepts as imagery, I wanted to explore and depict the relationship between the past, present, and future. From the beginning, I wanted to stray away from the traditional visual format of portraying time as a narrative through individual sequential images, and instead finding an experimental way to show temporal change in a single artwork. This led to my developed interest in interpreting moments in time as layers in an artwork. A source of inspiration was the layering processes in modern art, such as in the work of Frankenthaler and Pollock. Their art communicates the concept of layering space in a cohesive composition that I hope to accomplish, but in a more abstract and non-objective way. A more contemporary source of inspiration was in the photography technique of double exposure used by artists such as Wolkowska. This technique is closer to realism, but importantly, 
chooses visual information carefully to keep and remove to achieve the visual layers. My process was the following. Explore the grounds, make studies, experiment with layering, and integrate layers for a final artwork. First, I explored the grounds of the Institute. I made day trips to the Institute routinely, visiting nearly every major type of ecosystem on the campus, grassland, wetland, forest, and rivers and lakes to gain inspiration and reference for studies and potential artworks. I then created studies based on the photo photographs from these trips. These studies were to gain a better understanding of the environments that I depicted. My aim was to familiarize myself with them, to understand the atmosphere and the details, such as understanding how an environment is affected by the passage of time and the shifting light, shadows, and changing colors. You are currently viewing some examples of studies I've made from around the Institute. I made to, ex to explore different mediums and levels of abstraction to see which captured the atmosphere and place of the environment best. Then, taking what I learned from the studies, I began to experiment with ways of layering imagery to communicate an environment's relationship with time. What I found that helped to facilitate this visually with greater ease was the contrast between layers. Such examples of contrast were that of silhouette and form. For example, a grassland is more distinguishable from a forest than a lake. This also means that depicting subtle, short-term change is difficult in this format. Other examples of contrast include degrees of abstraction, different mediums, as they can have drastically different looks and textures, creating space between layers. For example, for my oil paintings, sometimes I would paint layers of shellac, which is a clear coating between the background layer and foreground layer or contrasting color schemes. This can be color versus black and white, or dulling down a layer using complementary colors. Here's an example of the experimentation process from individual environments to developing a relationship between the two different phases of time. And here are some more examples of experimentations with layering. Lastly, we come to the artworks that I find to be the most successful. I define successful as they're communicating a clear expression of time or lack thereof, maintaining a compelling composition and achieving a sense of atmosphere and place. This artwork features no layers as a basis of comparison or as a control group. Its subject matter is of the wetlands, which have been relatively unchanged in comparison to other environments in Pierce Cedar Creek. So it acts as a great contrast. These last two artworks fit my definition of success best, and so they are the artworks I gave to the Institute's collection. In conclusion, layers are an excellent way of exploring the evolution of environments. Over the course of this process, my personal and individual artistic growth have evolved significantly. 
I am highly satisfied with the artworks that I have completed, as I believe they have reached the intended goal of portraying the evolution of time experimentally. As stated earlier, I did discover that short-term change was especially difficult to, to portray within one artwork, but if given the opportunity, I would explore this facet of temporal change further. Thank you for your time. I would like to take a moment to thank my mentor, Chris Laporte for his guidance, the Pierce Cedar Creek Institute and staff for the continual help over this summer, Aquinas College, and the Gordon Art Fellowship for their support. Thank you for this wonderful opportunity. I, I cannot thank you enough. Okay. Um, uh, welcome back. Um, Ashley, if you can unmute, uh, and thank you for joining us. Um, I'll start this off with a quick question uh, that was asked uh, uh, actually, and I think it actually applies to all of our, um, uh, all of our, our artists and writers today. Um, but what was uh, a particularly valuable thing that you uh, learned or experienced this summer? And can you uh, talk to us a little bit about that? Um, I think specifically, something that helped me grow as an artist um, through this process was learning how to achieve a sense of space. Um, this is something that I learned to experiment with um, using using atmospheric perspective and um, figuring out like how to portray um, nature in a way that is both vibrant and colorful um, but not like too saccharine, um, not too sweet. Um, so finding that delicate balance between like an idealized vision um, and also a realistic vision and creating a good sense of space, um, that really helped me grow as an artist. If I wouldn't have been able to achieve that without being in nature and surrounded by it. So uh, another question that just po uh, came in the question and answer, um, uh, what was uh, the biggest challenge you had to overcome to complete your project? Um, the biggest challenge, I think, was to figure out a way to overlap the images um, and create a distinction between them. Um, it was easiest to do mixed media, um, so for some of them, it was watercolor and then graphite on top of that. That was an easy distinction, but I wanted to challenge myself um, and use the same medium. So that's why I did a lot in oil. Um, and that was difficult because sometimes it, you don't want it to be too separate so it doesn't feel like a cohesive artwork, but you want it to be separate enough so that it feels like two distinct places in time. So that was probably the biggest um, thing I had to overcome. Um, one final question. Um, are you going to continue on with um, uh, the layering layering in your artwork? Do you want yes. to continue to explore that? Yes, I, I have been exploring that um, even now in my uh, semester at Aquinas with all my um, 2D artwork, I've been experimenting with the layering processes and um, I hope to go forward with it with that in the future too. All right. Well, thank you, Ashley, for, uh, for your work this summer and uh, for joining us for this program. Uh, we are going to move on to our next uh, presentation, which is Gabriella Lantinga. Thank you. Hello, and welcome to my final report presentation. Uh, my name is Gabriella Lantinga. I'm here to talk about my experience at Pierce Cedar Creek. All right. So, um, like I said, my name is Gabriella Lantinga. Um, I am a recent graduate of Grand Rapids Community College. Um, I got my Associate of Arts in English and Communications. I am pursuing a bachelor's degree and my Bachelor of Arts in English and Creative Writing from Finlandia University, which is a school um, in Hancock, Michigan, way up in the UP. So, uh, yeah, um, I'm... Uh, 
a published author in the Grand Rapids Community College Arts and Literature magazine display. Um, I published three different works of mine, one short story and two poems, and that was my kind of opening into, uh, you know, professional writing. So um, I was very lucky to work with my mentor, Katie Collish. She's a poet and a professor of English at Grand Rapids Community College. Um, she provided guidance and insight throughout the course of the project. Okay, so the project um, that I worked on this summer is called Homebody. Um, and that's an interdisciplinary project focusing on discovering the parallels between my personal life experiences and the natural environment found in Michigan. Um, final work is a comprehensive collection of art and literature, uh, specifically poetry, creative nonfiction pieces, and art <laughs> compiled into a chapbook. Um, so yeah, like I said, my overall mission of the project was to discover the parallels between my own life and the natural world. So the content of this chapbook, um, it is organized into three separate parts, part one, two, and three. <laughs> um, and it is intentionally set this way. So each part um, follows a relative timeline of past, present, and future. Um, some of the major themes that you'll find in here are, well, of course, natural scenes, <laughs> familiarity, and defining slash finding quote unquote home. Um, and so you'll notice the contrast between two themes in the poetry as well. Some poems are significantly more nature-based than others, um, and some are written off-site, still inspired by my findings, but can contain a setting not based in a natural scene, um, such as one of my poems called The End of the Day, which is focused on an urban setting um, versus a fully nature-based piece, based piece uh, such as The Creek, which is uh, something I wrote at Pierce Cedar Creek. Um, so getting into methods, um, there are several ways that I went about doing this project. And so um, my main course of action each day that I was on site was to, um, well, get out there and go hiking. Um, and so I did, I hiked all of Fear Cedar Creek's trails, I think, ish. And um, in addition to that, I took out the canoe and canoed on Brewster Lake, a whole bunch throughout the summer. So that was really inspiring. Um, and it was necessary for my project, really. So I spent a lot of time outdoors. Um, and it was while I was out on site doing this hiking, canoeing, exploring. Um, that's where I would do my first drafts of writing, um, but also gaining ideas, um, feeling inspired for art pieces. Um, because the bugs were so bad this time of year, um, I typically took photos of the things that inspired me for paintings, and then I would paint them <laughs> off-site in my home studio, which is very nice. Um, but yeah, so, and that's partially why I had to do some off-site work was because of COVID um, this year. A lot of revisions and editing of my actual writing that happened on a computer, indoors, and then for most of the most part at my house. So my home office. Um, and so luckily in the last month of my fellowship, I was able to spend a week on site um, in one of the residency houses that they have here uh, have at the Institute. Um, and it was a wonderful time. It was really valuable to uh, immerse myself in the environment more deeply and create content that was inspired or based on settings that I would not otherwise have been able to see. Um, an example of this is uh, time I was able to spend hiking or simply being outdoors at Pierce Cedar Creek in the evenings and early mornings. Um, and those are times where I wouldn't have as inclined to do so just because of the commuting. So, all right, moving on. So we'll get into some of the content. So um, part one of Homebody opens with uh, the first short nonfiction piece. There are two of two nonfictions, and this is one of them. Uh, the first is called Trilliums, um, and it's about a page and a half long. I didn't include the whole, whole thing because if I read you my whole chapbook, that would take a very long time. <laughs> but uh, I'll include just a little excerpt from the text. This is from Trilliums. 
I have a gray garage that holds a $20 Craigslist surfboard and other silly dreams that didn't pan out, but I can still smile about it. I have a gray dog who smiles at me. He's always on his toes when I ask if he's ready to go home. When we do, we return, and it's just the two of us. A dog and a girl are almost enough to settle in. And then part three also opens with a nonfiction piece. I figured it would be nice to have the beginning and to the end have some sort of consistency in terms of opening with a nonfiction. I didn't do that with part two just because I only had two nonfiction pieces, um, and so that wasn't necessary. But yes, so part three opens with another nonfiction piece, um, and this one is called Glimpses, and here is an excerpt from that. I never witnessed the falcon perched on a mighty pine, only the backside of his wings soaring through dead trees. Hiking along, spotting the white tail of a doe, who jumps out of sight into the bush. Peeking over from the living room, just getting a glimpse of the only kiss I've ever seen between my parents. Only one. Moving on, the next bit of content I will get into is some of the poetry. So, um, same as before, I included two excerpts from two different poems that I wrote. Um, later on in this presentation, I will actually present and read to you <laughs> one entire poem. Um, but this is just to get a kind of a taste of the different themes that you see and read inside this inside this chat book. So, um, this is an excerpt from The Creek, which is found in part one of the book. <clears throat> I think there is a small wooden lodge across the water. A branch bursts through its broken window, glassless panes in which I still cannot see through. And here's an excerpt from The Doves, which is found in part three. The morning dove offers my mind rest, a vision and a feeling of a couch worn in with sunken bottoms, where I sit and sink in to steep in warm mugs of hot, hot tea. <laughs> All right, so more content, moving into the art portion of everything. Um, so the mediums that I used in this project were primarily charcoal, acrylic, um, either on canvas boards um, or actually just canvas and then paper as well. Um, so and obviously I have not included every single piece of art, but I've included some of the more vital ones, I think. And so they all have their own meanings and um, some of them are connected to certain pieces of literature in the in the chat book um, and so I will get to that in just a moment but here is um, one of the pieces of art I did this summer it's called the loon which is you guessed it a balloon um, and first looking at this I realized well my husband told me it looks like you know he's kind of swimming in blood or something horrible <laughs> and I assure you that it is not that it is water but it's uh you know artistic expression here so you know be liberal with that um here's another piece it's called invisible trails um this piece is acrylic on canvas this is one of my bigger pieces actually um it's hard to tell on a computer of course but um this one, I definitely went more abstract than I normally do. Um, and I found that that's something I did a lot with this project was I branched out and tried um, some new things and new techniques and kind of went out of my comfort zone a bit, which was a push. Definitely it was a push for me, but necessary, I think. And that's why this experience at Pierce Cedar Creek was so important and valuable is because I got to push myself in ways I probably wouldn't have had I not had the chance, the opportunity to. So um, moving on, here is a piece, two pieces. <laughs> uh, here's an art piece that I created. It's called Soon I Will Go, and it's charcoal and acrylic on paper. Um, and there's a poem, like I said earlier, that is associated with it. So I included that here, and I will read it to you. The poem is called Discovery. The water ripples, yet I do not move. I sit and sip and glide in my canoe. My straw hat, reflections off the surface, creating lines of small amplitude, bouncing off my lenses to shine in my eyes. What solitude, just the birds and I on this calm lake? 
My soul rests, my mind thinks of nothing but words on the page tenderly. If one could feel this serene silence of birds chirping forever, I believe wholeheartedly I would never doubt again, nor fear those who follow me, for they are not bears, but rather the spotted backs of chittering chipmunks. My vessel carries nothing in the fullest, only a writer, searching for familiarity, and a notebook to remember it by when I find it. And here it is before me. Okay, so thank you so much for listening. Um, just some acknowledgments here. Um, I want to give a very great thanks to Pierce Cedar Creek Institute for providing the funding and hosting this fellowship and allowing me the opportunity to build my skills as a writer and as an artist. Um, without this experience, I may not have had the chance to build my skills as much as I did, like I said. So being able to focus solely on this passion of mine has encouraged, encouraged me to continue pursuing writing as more than a hobby, but as a career. So, oops. So I'm so grateful. <laughs> um, additional thanks go out to Katie Collish. Um, she was my mentor who worked alongside me in this project. Um, my writing improved dramatically, and I was really able to dial in on my creative style because of her guidance. And so I'm so grateful for her for her help in all of this. Additionally, thank you so much to Great Novice Community College English Department. Um, they were the first ones who kind of got me there, gave me that confidence to start writing. Um, and just the support from all of them in the department, you know, Sean Mackey, um, Marianne Lezert, I could go on. <laughs> um, their support and um, the, the chance to get published in the Arts and Literature magazine, um, it was such a special opportunity. So I just thank all of you for your support and guidance as I made this huge step. And so, yeah, thank you so much. And thank you all for listening. I'm looking forward to hearing some questions. All right. Um, thank you for that. And uh, welcome, Gabriella. Uh, a couple questions for you. Uh, do you consider uh, yourself uh, to, uh, do you see yourself continuing to integrate art and writing in the future? Um, into my life, yeah, yeah, um, I would say so. Um, I mean, writing has always been very important to me and um, painting and drawing as well. Um, I think well, moving forward, you know, things are really busy, um, school, things are weird with COVID, but I think um, having this opportunity really pushed me to want to pursue it more. And so I think just looking into the future, there's definitely more of that um, laying ahead for me. So. Um, Kate, Katie had a question for you. Uh, she said, how did, how did you get out of your comfort zone in writing? Oof. Well, this was definitely the largest body of work I've ever worked on before. So that in itself was a push doing that within a two, three month time frame. So um, pushing myself to, you know, generate that much content, but then also, you know, make sure it's So I really branched out and not just in that way, but in terms of content, you know, it was really it was emotionally taxing um, on me. Um, so I think that was huge too, just in terms of like what I was writing. That was definitely, it was the push to get out of my comfort zone. So. And then uh, one more, one more question. How did you come uh, to the inspiration in doing invisible trails. So the painting invisible trails, what, it, what was your inspiration behind that? Or how, what, uh, um, yeah, how did you come up with, with that? Yeah, so um, on, during one of my hikes, I saw that kind of scene. Um, and I didn't include the actual photo that I took of it, but um, I just, it was so beautiful. And so one thing in the beginning of my fellowship that I thought a lot about um, was thinking about Kind of this concept of where the trails like won't take me or like seeing places that like aren't set like it's not a set trail but they're there if you look for them and there's like ways you can pursue your passions that might not be super set in stone um and so i was thinking like i saw this field and i'm like oh um it was so it was just amazing to see and i just saw 
these kind of invisible trails throughout it. So that was what kind of like inspired that piece. Um, and I think the abstract factor of that just came out of um, that concept of something being invisible or not truly there. And then uh, one final question uh, that uh, someone said uh, asked is, is your work for sale? <laughs> um, I don't know if you mean paintings or writing. Um, I'm right now currently working on publishing some of the individual poems and things like that. So, um, but if you're talking about paintings, I, yeah, I would say so. Um, I would have to get in contact with whoever's interested. <laughs> but um, <laughs> yeah. All right, all right. Um, that question's in the chat, so you can follow up with uh, with that person. <laughs> That's good. All right, uh, I we're going to move on to our next presentation, uh, which is by uh, Ruby Henriksen. Here we go. Hello everyone, thank you for coming to our final report presentations. My name is Ruby Henriksen and I am one of the Gordon Art Fellows this year. I go to Grand Valley State University. My faculty mentor is my painting professor, Jill Eggers, and my project is titled Ode to Salamander Heaven, Exploring an Intimate Relationship with Nature Through Painting. Just a quick overview of what I completed for this project. I completed three large paintings on canvas 31 small plein air paintings on panel, and I worked in a sketchbook. The plein air painting process was this resilient way of overcoming the obstacles um, that COVID-19 placed in front of us. Um, when I wrote my proposal, we originally thought I'd have studio access all summer, and that just was not a reality. So I had to take my studio outside, and it became this really interesting duality of work process for me this summer. In the end, I wouldn't have it any other way. I think I learned so much and I'm really proud of the outcome. The work I created deals with the idea of capturing and appreciating the magic that the woodlands have to behold, something that has been significant in my life since early childhood, and it is why I titled it Ode to Salamander Heaven. Salamander Heaven was what we called the woods behind my grandparents' house when I was a very little girl. I used to spend hours out there exploring and finding tons of salamanders, among other critters. And of course, for this project, it's not about that exact piece of land, but rather the magic and wonder that I found there when I was younger, and how you can still find that very magic in any forest, anywhere. The experience of spending hours and hours outside this summer further solidified my project's intentions for myself. I felt I was nurturing a relationship with the natural world by being so often outside, just observing quietly, alone, and simply documenting what was around me. I feel as though I have generated fertile ground for more artwork to come. The research involved in the project became something of a daily ritual. I lugged my backpack, heavy with paints and supplies, to various outdoor places, like hiking trails, fields, you name it. Nearly every day from June and into July, I painted plein air. When I wasn't outside painting, I was either hiking, taking photos, preparing or generating larger paintings inside the studio. This was also the process I was engaged in before I began painting outside in early June. Painting smaller studies outside provided me with so much growth and pr freedom. After this practice began, I was no longer hung up on what to paint. I simply painted what was right in front of me. This was both motivating and inspiring as I began to formulate ideas for what to paint on a larger scale. Here are just a select few of my favorite plein air paintings from this summer. At the beginning of this presentation, I provided a picture of all 31 of them, and I will um, put another picture of them at the end of the presentation as well. 
The process of painting outdoors asked me to think about just observing and recording information. I found this to be a process of raw discovery in ways of handling paint, value, color, and light and movement. This way of looking is different from looking at a photo reference because you observe the basics of shape, color, and value in a way that is enriched by the movement of the sun, spatial relations to the world around you, and the mood of the forest on that very day. I even look now in retrospect and I see how the things I've learned from these paintings inform the paintings that I'm making today. This act of practice I had during the summer was very helpful in providing my inspiration for larger paintings in the studio. So with these larger paintings, the conceptual elements come into play much more. In every single one of these paintings, I began just by thinking about my original intentions for this entire research project. To capture this magic, this wonder, capture this mystery of the forest and the atmosphere within it and the life that dwells in it also. However, amidst this summer of intense and sudden uncertainty, I can't deny that the pandemic hasn't influenced the conceptual elements of a lot of these paintings. I see this most frequently represented in tangled branches, darkness, and visual perspectives that are flipped or ambiguous. This shows up in the plein air paintings too. Many of these paintings have become visual metaphors for my experience of this unforgettable summer, using the forest as a catalyst for these emotional expressions. This painting is titled Cosmic Vertigo. It is the first painting I painted after the world shut down. I see now, in hindsight, that the darkness and foreboding atmosphere in this painting is undoubtedly a reflection and result of the very atmosphere of, of, of our lives at that time. The title, Cosmic Vertigo, both reflects the magical atmosphere in the painting and also the feeling of uneasiness that settled into every corner of our lives. An uneasiness that is seemingly out of our control. This is the second larger painting I completed this summer, and it is similar to the previous painting I just discussed in a lot of ways. The atmosphere, light, tangled branches all speak of fear and hope and uncertainty. The perspective gives a sense of smallness. This sense of smallness heightens the uncertainty, as well as positioning the viewer in a way that is precarious. The knowing because there is this mysterious event happening outside of our vantage point. It is an event that we are unaware of, but the world around us, the animals around us, they are reacting to it. So I was thinking about this intuitive knowing that wildlife has in regards to many things like migration or protecting themselves or maybe being able to sense a natural disaster. Additionally, when I look back on this body of work, I've noticed how my work deals with themes of liminality. I'm thinking of liminality as the in-between of profound or disorienting situations which interrupt the flow of normalcy, like night being the in-between of each day. Yet these disruptions of norms give us the rare ability to reorient ourselves emotionally, socially, spiritually, etc. We're able to step out of ourselves, become uncomfortable and confront change within these spaces whether they are something collective like the pandemic, an earthly phenomenon like nightfall, or even following a trail deep into the forest canopy. I've been painting scenes of dusk or night for a while now, and it has this veil of mystery I've so often described as magic. In these regards, I now reinforce my understanding of the magic I searched for in the forest this summer to be sometimes defined as a liminal space a threshold which we may anticipate crossing or have already began to cross. This idea serves, in my mind, as also an understanding of this globally transitional moment we found ourselves in this year. I was able to display my work in a group show alongside two other painting students from Grand Valley. The show is titled Outside and Inward, and it is up in Padnos Gallery at Calder Art Center on Grand Valley's campus. The show ran from August 31st to October 2nd. So it, you guys won't be able to see it because it's being taken down today, but I'm still so thankful and grateful 
that I was able to display the work at some point in time. And um, it also gave me an opportunity to take some really good uh, documentation of the work to show in this presentation. I would love to display um, all of the Creative Fellows work in this way at some point in time um, if an opportunity arises. I think it would be a really great way to um, show the work as a time capsule, look at the commonalities we find between all of our work that we may not have originally expected or intended. I'd like to thank Pierce Cedar Creek for their support, facilities, and inspiration they've given me. I am so incredibly thankful for the opportunity and for an institution that supports young artists in this way. I'd also like to thank my faculty mentor, Jill Eggers, for the guidance and support you've given me. All right. Uh, thank you, Ruby, for that uh, presentation. Um, let's see. Uh, yeah, there, there you go. Um, yes, we can. Okay. Uh, question. Yeah. Um, can you tell us uh, about uh, uh, maybe what is what is your kind of uh, what is the, what is the most valuable takeaway that you had uh, from this summer? Or what ha how has this summer kind of stretched you more than you were uh, expecting? Yeah. Um, I think one of the main things. I learned was learning to listen to what my paintings needed um, and responding to the changes that were happening on both large and small scale. I also think it was a really amazing opportunity to take like this deep dive into what I really like to paint and take some time to really give that deep consideration to my um, painting practice. Um, a question from, uh, actually there's a couple questions from Fritz and um, on, online and uh, so we'll ask them in, in kind of actually reverse order, but uh, most of your colors in your paintings are, are mono, monotone or monochrome, chromatic. Um, is this your technique or an emphasis in your message? Um, and then have you, have you done plain air before? Yeah, that's a really good question. A lot of um, my paintings for a while now have been kind of monotone and, um, you know, some ways I'm not really sure why, but um, I think that it kind of does this thing where it uh, flattens the image in a way, and then it also kind of gives a strange atmosphere to it. And then um, I have not done plain air before. This was my first time doing plain air. So yeah, it was a huge learning experience um, in that respect too. And, and uh, Fritz also asked, uh, are your paintings for sale? Yes, sure. <laughs> um, I'll put my email in the com or in the uh, comment box if you want to contact me. <laughs> All right. All right. Very good. Um, thank you, Ruby. Uh, we are getting close to one o'clock um, and we have one more presentation left. Um, so we hope that you can stick around uh, for that. Um, our final presentation is uh, from Elizabeth Walstoni um, uh, talking about her nature and words. Uh, program. Oopsie. Uh. Hi, my name is Elizabeth Walstoney, and I was one of the Nature and Words Fellowship recipients this summer at Pierce Cedar Creek Institute. I created a collection of 10 place-based linked short stories with supplemental maps titled all together, The Fruiting Season. This is my final report presentation on my work and my process. I'm a senior at Aquinas College this year where I'm studying geography with a concentration in mapping technology and a writing minor. I was advised in this project by Dr. Dan Mancia, who's been my professor for a number of classes I've taken for my minor.
My original proposed project, called at first A Place Outside, was a collection of short stories exploring the concept of place supplemented by related maps to each story. Place is a concept I've dealt with in geography theory from the more academic side, but it's also something I enjoy exploring in fiction, and I wanted to do some work at the intersection between those two disciplines. The maps I made and the stories I wrote took place at various scales, including Barry County, Hope and Baltimore Townships, which surround Pierce Cedar Creek Institute, and the Institute itself. I was interested in our shared physical landscape and the unique understandings we all have of that same background. As I mentioned, it's sort of an intersection of geography and of writing, of the theoretical concepts I've learned and the personal relationships I've experienced and written about. I spent roughly half of the summer at the Cedar Creek Institute experiencing the operations and surrounding areas of Pierce. I was also on site for all of last summer as a Stevie Land Management Fellow, so this was an opportunity to also build off of my personal experiences in the past. I began by reading place-based short story collections and began to work on my own. I wrote and edited in May through July and moved into map making at the end of July and the beginning of August. At the completion of this project, I have created an 80-page collection supplemented by eight maps. As a final part of my project, I will be self-publishing a small run of this collection after final revisions from PCCI, which will hopefully be available in the gift shop. I created a number of maps for this project, which unfortunately I don't have time to describe in depth, but I've included a sampler here of the various scales and styles of maps I experimented with. I in introduced some historical information I found in a 1913 Barry County Atlas provided by the Institute in this first map on the left, which is a short history of Hope and Baltimore Townships. In the center, I have a map of the ephemeral ponds of Pierce Cedar Creek Institute. These are ponds that appear only sometimes after rain, but always in the same place. And finally, I contrasted the quarter divisions or the standardized survey system used across the United States with the actual contours of the land underneath it, which I found to be an interesting contrast representative of my project. So as you can see, some of these maps correlate specifically to the content of the story as the ephemeral pond map does. Others are more history based and some I'm interested in for more purely conceptual reasons that frame how I view the stories. I also included some segments of my story writing in the text on each map. Unfortunately, I don't have enough time to read all my stories to you today but I thought I would share a short one called One Inch Apart. That morning, Evie and her mother screamed back and forth in the kitchen and slammed their coffee cups around in the first glimpse of light like people with no shame. Evie did not know what to do with her life, and her mother did. This was all they had to talk about. They hiked out to the nature center birdhouses in tight silence. Pink dawn mist pooled in the hollows of the ground and blurred out the morning. The elbows of the spotted napweed plants crowding the grassland were hung with dewy bowls of cobwebs. Evie looked up over the rise of the meadow and watched a bird fly overhead, but really saw it, how its little body dipped under the turning of its wings. It nearly brought her to crying, and she looked back down at the trampled grass. Her mother was almost out of sight on the trail ahead. She wore water-repellent trousers with socks pulled over them to protect her from ticks. She took all the proper precautions. 
Though she was now in her sixties, she walked fast as ever. Each Tuesday, she looked inside the wooden boxes hammered into the prairie to see how many eastern bluebirds had managed to nest there. They were somewhat delicate birds with specific needs, and they had a hard time surviving. Often, other species took over, house sparrows or starlings. When this happened, Evie's mother scooped their nests out and put them into the grass. There were enough of them in the world already. Evie had not gone to visit the bird boxes before. It was a new thing, living at home. She lost her job in retirement planning seven months before, and her ex-husband had gained full custody of their three children not long after. Now she was out of the city. Though something stirred and told her how it was not right, and her mother said these things aloud for her, Evie did not know where to follow the feeling. She went to Alcoholics Anonymous meetings in the damp basement of the Lutheran church in town and accompanied her mother to her retirement activities and waited for something to reveal itself. In the fourth nesting box, which her mother let her check alone, Evie found three tiny eggs. White, not blue, like the bluebird's eggs. They were the size of the first two knuckles on her index finger. She remembered an old Explorer's Magazine article she used to read over and over again. Well, there were two of them. One was about school children in Moscow who lived in apartments and played in indoor water parks under lighting that turned their skin and their cartoon character bathing suits and the chain necklaces they wore a dead yellow. The other was a photo essay exploring abandoned farmhouses of the former Dust Bowl. Silt drifted up on the couches and between the kitchen cabinets still shone with paint the blue of bluebird's eggs. The dry air spread up through the floors and over the family portraits left on the wall. Evie had stolen the magazine from the collage material shelf of her sixth grade art class. All she wanted to do was look at the pictures of other people's impossible lives over and over. It made her feel things she couldn't say. They were all children, but the rooms they lived in would make them strangers. Their kitchen cabinets were blue, like the eggs lying in a cup of feathers at the bottom of the nesting box should have been. Evie's mother came up behind her and said, toss that one. The Eastern Bluebird needed the box more than they did. Her mother knew how to make these decisions and believe in them. Evie scooped the feathers and the eggs up in her hands and held them over the grass. They were tiny. She could crush them between two fingers if she wanted to. The mist was lifting, the day burning into focus. She would change her life. Evie touched one of the eggs with the tip of her finger, and the sun turned over. Moving forward, I will continue submitting individual stories from this collection for publication in literary journals. In the spring, I will work on developing some of this material into a book-length collection of short stories for my senior honors capstone project at Aquinas College. And in the future, I hope to continue pursuing writing personally and professionally. Thank you so much for your time and interest. And thank you to PCCI and my advisor, Danny and Zia, for all of their support. All right, thank you, Elizabeth. And... Yeah, thank you. Just uh, do that. Okay. Um, uh, some questions for you uh, from an anonymous attendee. Your work at uh, Pierce Cedar Creek Institute this year was quite different from last year, and so it would be unfair to ask you to compare them. Uh, but what big take did you come away with over both experiences that does compare or contrast? Oh, that, I I really like that question. Um, I think the first thing that comes to mind is actually something I said in my PowerPoint, which is that we are all kind of in the same place at Pierce, but we experience it so differently. Like I remember myself and my partner in the Land Management Fellowship last year had way different experiences of what we were doing and like way different kind of understandings of how we spent the summer. And that's a similar theme I was kind of exploring in my writing. Um, so I suppose it might sound a little obvious to say everybody's different, but more just that like there's so much um, kind of like, I don't know, the wealth in human experience, even if we're all just experiencing the same thing. 
Uh, your advisor, uh, mentor for this summer, Dan, had a question. Um, fiction writing, unlike many other narrative art forms, uh, exclusively concerns itself with the human experience. Even if we're writing about non-human characters, we're still personifying them in some way. How did your study uh, of the natural world and mapping of the landscape inform your writing about the human experience? Hmm. I would say actually looking at um, historical data in some of the maps I was using, um, even some that ultimately didn't make it into the collection, really kind of gave me a framework for how what we think of as just nature is actually still really the product of like centuries of human development. Um, and so I think looking into the history of the Berry County area kind of made me realize that even the woods are the way they are right now because someone else came through it for me. So I think it's that it is a character of our experience because we really do impact it. Um, especially when those who came before us that we can't see. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, uh, a final question maybe is uh, Sarah Sicewarda asked, uh, what, did, what do you plan to do after graduation? Oh, um, wonderful question. Um, <laughs> I don't have a specific plan right now because I'm actually interested in a lot of things. Um, I'm actually looking into some um, Masters of Fine Arts and Writing programs. Um, I also may take a year to try to get some work experience um, in case graduate programs are still remote next semester. Um, I'm also looking at graduate programs in human geography so um, I will say I'm still exploring my future. <laughs> All right, well, thank you. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you, um, Ruby, Gabriella, uh, Ashley. And uh, thank you to, um, oh shoot, who was our first person? Um, <laughs> it's been too too long of a day. Uh, uh, Addison, for all of your uh, uh, work uh, to this summer, and um, thank you for uh, sharing in this in this uh, uh, in this presentation. Um, just a final reminder before we end this program that uh, we will be joining again next week, Friday, uh, to hear from our researchers, and uh, we hope that uh, uh, many of you can uh, join us again. Um, so that's next week, Friday, October nine at noon. Um, thank you, and I uh, hope to see you uh, either in a program or at the Institute sometime soon. Take care.